Okay, getting started here. Our seminar speaker today is Lou Lucier from the Research Aviation Facility. Lou's professional background was that he started as a meteorologist in the Air Force, and from there he pursued graduate work at the Naval Postgraduate School and did a postdoc there for a couple of years before he joined the Research Aviation Facility, NCARS RAF, um, almost a year ago, almost exactly a year ago now. So at the RAF, he's a project manager dealing with uh, setting up the projects, execute, yeah, executing them, and uh, making sure that the instrument data coming off the airplane is good, both during the field project and afterward. So if anyone here is thinking about proposing a project using the NCAR NSF G5 or a C-130, Lou is one of the guys who would be good to talk to, both before in the proposal stage, and he'd be the one helping you with the project during it and afterward. So with that, Lou. OK, thank you, Stuart. Okay, so I'm going to talk today about uh, tropical cyclogenesis. This is, I guess, more of a hobby now that I'm doing project management full time, but still something I really enjoy. So what we're going to talk about today is tropical cyclogenesis within the critical era of easterly waves. We're going to go over some basic theory of tropical cyclogenesis. Then we're very fortunate in that we have a, a couple field campaigns in the recent years. Uh, PREDICT, which took place in 2010 in the Atlantic Basin and T-PARC and TCS-08, which took place in 2008 in the West and North Pacific. So as we go through the basic theory, we'll provide illustrative examples from both those field campaigns of developing storms to show you what we're looking for. We're then going to discuss some other theories on mesoscale organization within the critical layer of easterly waves, including a thermodynamic control mechanism. But the crux of the talk, or the best part of the talk, as I like to say, is we're going to look at two case studies from recent cases. The first is Typhoon Nuri, which was observed during the Tea Park field campaign. And the second is Hurricane Sandy in 2012, which I'm sure everyone is at least somewhat familiar with. So the theory we're going to go over today is often affectionately referred to as the marsupial paradigm. Uh, this reference was coined by my advisor, Mike Montgomery, because it refers to the wave pouch where the proto-vortex actually develops. So the wave pouch actually protects the seedling vortex as it develops. And we'll go through over this, go over the, some of this in detail. So this is what I call my marsupial primer slide. One of the issues we have with these talks sometimes is that people get lost in all the terminology we use. So if you're not familiar with everything we're talking about, there's a tendency just to tune it out and not even pay attention. So we're trying desperately to avoid that. So here's some of the key terminology for you to uh, learn throughout the talk. The first one is pouch. And all the pouches or wave pouch is a protective environment that uh, protects the seedling vorticity and allows it to grow. It protects it from lateral intrusion of dry air and vertical wind shear. The sweet spot is really the center of the circulation. This is where all the action takes place. We see low level vorticity accretion here in convective organization. This is shown to be the favorite spot location for tropical cyclone genesis. A frame of reference is also important, and we're going to talk about this a lot today. We're going to refer to a co-moving frame and a resting frame. The co-moving frame is in a frame of reference moving with a wave, and the resting frame is just an earth, re earth relative frame. Another parameter we're going to discuss is the Akubo Weiss parameter. This is a, basically a measure of rotation. So it's basically the difference between vorticity squared and strain squared. And what it does is it allows us to partition the flow into rotational components versus strain or shearing components. And it's really a good way to, to see whether the vorticity you have is really, is, excuse me, not cyclonic, but rotational vorticity and what we need to build up a tropical cyclone. And finally, we're going to go over, some, we're going to show some Lagrangian manifolds a couple times real quick. Um, we're not going to get into heavy detail of this, but just look at it this way. The stable manifolds are repeller particles and the unstable manifolds attract particles. So this theory is relatively new. In 2009, Tim Dunkerton, Mike Montgomery, and Zhuo Wang uh, set out a paper looking at 55 developing cases in the Atlantic and North Pacific Basin. And there's three general hypotheses about tropical cyclogenesis that they expound in their paper. And they're broken into also sub-hypotheses under it. So the first one is the critical layer, and Kelvin Katz eye there within is a region of cyclonic rotation and weak straining shearing deformation. So the cartoon on the right, we're going to walk through real quick, then you can forget most of the terminology if it suits you. But basically, they looked at 55 cases, African easterly jet form, uh, excuse me, African easterly wave formations. So these are waves basically in uh, sheared flow. And in this pattern, you have a ridge, 
a trough line and another ridge. The critical line, or critical attitude as we'll call it, intersects the trough in the center of, in the, center of the Kelvin's cat's eye circulation, and that's what we're going to refer to as the sweet spot. The thick black lines are streamlines or stream functions, and in the co-moving frame, they're an approximation of particle or parcel trajectories. So anything trapped with inside the Kelvin's cat's eye flow is with inside it, and air from outside cannot enter. The turquoise lines are basically the attractor. That's where the vorticity gets tracked to and the convection. So you see over time, the dark pink, if you consider that positive vorticity, over time, the wave breaks and rolls up and rolls up and amplifies around the sweet spot location. The first sub-hypothesis of this is that synoptic and mesoscale anomalies within the wave pouch amplify and grow together. So as I mentioned, the original study was conducted on African easterly waves. We tried to push this into different regions. And this is an example I'm going to show you from the Western Pacific. This is Super Typhoon Man Yi, which we observed in the TCS-08 dry run. So what we have plotted here is a Kubelweiss parameter, which I already gave you the definition of. The colored contours are positive values of a Kubelweiss. And we also see streamlines. These are low-level streamlines at 850 hectopascal in the co-moving frame. So basically, what you see in the time series is a closed cyclonic circulation throughout the time series. What we also see is several different Akubaweiss maximum located within the wave pouch. Over time, these Akubaweiss maximum grow and organize around the sweet spot, which is denoted in this depiction by the purple cross. The final subhypothesis for H1 is that this multiscale interaction leads a pathway for bottom-up development. Now, in the 80s, 90s, uh, in early 2000s, there was a big push for top-down, excuse me, top-down versus bottom-up development. The theory of top-down development basically emphasizes the role of a mid-level vortex. The mid-level vortex is then brought down to the surface to build the low-level vortex, and that's how you get the vorticity monolith for the tropical cyclone. Bottom-up hypothesis was offered as an alternative to this, and this focuses on basically rotating deep convection. The rotating deep convection has positive vorticity anomalies in the lower troposphere. These positive vorticity anomalies are then able to merge together and amplify and grow the vorticity monolith from the bottom of the atmosphere upwards. So to the, to the left of me is actually a panel of a numerical simulation we did of the previous case, Typhoon Man Yi, just as an example. So what we have here is streamlines in the co-moving frame. The purple line is the critical latitude, and the black line is the wave trough. I've highlighted regions A and B to highlight a couple of these areas of rotating deep convection. In both of these areas, you see the shading is actually vorticity and the contours are upward vertical motion. So this is a strong area of rotating deep convection that ends up getting stronger over time. Area B, closer to the sweet spot, there's actually two smaller areas of convection that strengthen and grow over time, and eventually those areas merge and form a stronger vortex near the, center of the storm, uh, near the center of the storm. So the second hypothesis is that Kelvin's cat's eye, located within the wave's critical layer, provides a set of quasi-closed material contours. And you can read the rest of it. This, this illustration is actually a little more relevant to what we're going to discuss in some of the examples I'll show later. So I actually kind of like this schematic to describe what we're going to look at when we look at some of our data from our actual cases. So what we have in this schematic is streamlines in two different frames of reference. The green streamlines indicate an open wave in the Earth relative frame of reference. The black streamlines are actually the, uh, the streamlines in the co-moving frame. And these basically are approximation of the wave pouch. You see, it's quasi-closed in nature. It doesn't have to be a completely closed boundary. And this is another idea we'll look at further along in the top. Now, the benefit of the wave pouch is that, protect, that since it's a recirculation region, it protects the seedling vortex inside from the dry air that might be outside. It also allows continued moisture, moistening with inside by, continue, by repeated bouts of convection. As we've shown on the last slide, the critical attitude is the line where the wave's phase speed equals the background zonal flow, and the wave trough is the area of zero meridional velocity. So this is the structure we're going to see as we look at some real data from some cases. So the next thing we're going to talk real quickly about in the basic theory is the pouch structure. 
So as I mentioned, 55 Atlantic storms were originally used to set up this theory. And what you see here is a composite of those storms. So what we've done is taken the 55 storms, the ER840 reanalysis data, applied a low-pass filter to it, and plotted streamlines in the resting and co-moving frame along with the Kuba Weiss. These are plotted every 12 hours from three days prior to Genesis to Genesis time. We define Genesis as a time where the National Hurricane Center declares the storm a tropical depression. As you can see, three days prior, there is a slight hit of a waveform as that inverted V signature. Over time, we still don't see much of a closed circulation in the resting frame. This highlights one of the main advantages of the co-moving frame, is that even three days prior to Genesis, we see a closed circulation. We see not only the closed circulation, but the Akuba Weiss maximum is centered near the center of that circulation and the sweet spot. As we get closer to Genesis, about a day out, we actually see a closed circulation finally emerging in the Earth relative frame. Notice that the Okubo Weiss maximum is at the north end of the wave in the Earth relative frame. This is consistent with some previous studies by uh, Bracken and Bozart, who showed some composites of Atlantic storms. And they show that the wave with the vorticity maximum in the northern part. However, in the Earth relative frame, the, the Okubo Weiss maximum in this case remains at the center of the circulation. Finally, within tw 24 hours, we have a closed circulation in both frames of reference. But the location of the circulation is slightly different. As we continue to talk about part, part structure, one of the interesting aspects of part structure is vertical alignment. A vertically coherent or vertically aligned pouch is favorable for genesis, as it protects the atmosphere through a deep column and allows the convection to grow upright and allows the vorticity to allows the vorticity to concentrate inside and protects multiple levels from intrusion of dry air. So this is a case from PREDICT. This is uh, Tropical Storm Matthew, which occurred in 2010 in September. So on the top is the pouch position from the ECMWF analysis data. So what we've done with the different symbol is excuse me, plot the pouch the sweet spot position at the 925, 850, 700, and 500 hectopascal levels. These are all done at different times corresponding to six research flights that went into the developing disturbance. So as you can see on the 21st, there's absolutely no indication of any alignment of the pouch. And I'm sorry, but that gray probably does not show very well um, in this forum. Um, on the 22nd, excuse me, on the 21st at 12Z, we see alignment of the upper and lower pouches, but no alignment of the mid, excuse me, the lower and mid levels. In fact, the lower and mid levels don't come aligned till the 22nd. We see both flights on the 22nd. All levels of the circulation are aligned from 925 to 500 hectopascals. So the question is, how much effect does this have on spin up, and what's the benefit of having this vertical alignment of the pouch? The bottom panel is actually the, the tangential wind derived from the domain based on the droplet sonde analysis from each of these flights. So basically, we took the pouch center at 850, conducted tangential wind profiles throughout the atmosphere from the drop wind sonde as from each of these missions. The colors generally correspond to the same colors in the same times of flights as the plot above. So we see during the first flight, there is a relatively uniform tangential wind profile up to about 600 hectopascals. Over the next couple days, while the, while the pouch is not favorably aligned, we see spin up in the low levels followed by spin down spin up in the mid levels, but there's no consistent spin up either at the low mid levels while the pouch remains unaligned. When the pouch finally becomes, comes into alignment on the 22nd, we see a deep layer spin up as highlighted by the green and yellow lines throughout about four, from the surface to about 400 hectopascals. So this clearly illustrates the benefit of having a vertically aligned pouch, and some folks even say that it's a sufficient condition for genesis, although not necessary. So I said we'd talk a little bit about Lagrangian manifolds, and the benefit to using these Lagrangian structures is that they provide a more accurate representation of the flow boundary. Whereas the streamlines are only approximation of parcel trajectories, these are, actually, these are actual boundaries that particles cannot cross. Most of the work we're going to show in here is uh, from my colleague Blake Rutherford, 
So this is a little schematic describing what you're going to see on some of the slides that follow, and an example of uh, Tropical Storm Gaston, also from the PREDICT case in 2010. So as I mentioned before, we have two manifolds, a stable manifold which acts as a repeller to particles, and the unstable manifold that acts as an attractor. So where these intersect is a hyperbolic point. Anything trapped inside here, this would be basically define the pouch region. Everything in here would be trapped inside and be able to recirculate within whereas these boundaries cannot be crossed by particles. This is a really good way to define what can make it into the pouch and what is actually encompassed in the pouch versus what is actually excluded. And the case we're going to show right here is from PREDICT and it's Tropical Storm Gaston. Now Gaston was kind of a unique case in that the initial observations, it was a tropical storm. And then it then weakened real quickly to below its tropical storm strength. And most people thought that it would form again, which is why they sampled it on so many days. So for these plots for Gaston, what you see highlighted is actually relative humidity as the shading, with the black being low values relative humidity. And you see your Lagrangian boundaries. Early on in the period, there's a pretty defined wave pouch that's moist in the center. However, you notice over time the boundary beginning to open towards the south. And with this boundary opening, some of the dry air from outside of the pouch is able to wrap in. And that ultimately spells the demise of Gaston and is one of the main reasons why, the, why Gaston failed to redevelop. So basically, we've outlined tropical cyclogenesis within the critical layer and how waves actually form. There's, there's not much doubt among most people that it is good to protect a vortex from vertical wind shear or from dry air intrusion. What's up for debate now is the exact mesoscale mechanism by how these form and how the vorticity actually grows. So I'm going to share a couple other thoughts on that before we get into the examples of Nuri and Manyi, oh, excuse me, not Manyi, Sandy. So this is what we call a thermodynamic control mechanism. This was proposed by Dave Raymond and his colleagues down in New Mexico Tech. Uh, their, first, their first ideas on this came actually from some idealized simulations. Since then, they've tried to apply it to real-world data collected during both TPARC and PREDICT. So the thermodynamic control mechanism emphasizes the role of the mid-level vortex. Unlike, unlike the top-down theory, it's not actually bringing that mid-level vortex to the surface. Rather, it emphasizes the mid-level vortex is able to alter, excuse me, alter the nature of convection. So the strength in the mid-level vortex alters the type of convection. We end up with a warm perturbation in the up, mid to upper troposphere and a cold perturbation in the surface. This leads to a bottom heavy mass flux profile, which in turn allows convergence in the near surface level and spin up of the low level vortex. This is just a couple quick examples from the Typhoon Nuri case, which we'll look at in detail later. So if you look at this plot of absolute vorticity with height, from Dave's uh, uh, analysis of Doppler radar and dropwind sons. For Nuri 1, we see a relatively uniform absolute vorticity pattern up to about 4 kilometers. But by Nuri 2, we see the spin up of this mid level vortex near 5 kilometers, as indicated by the green line. The resulting mass flux profile for Nuri 1, we have a maximum in the upper troposphere, which leads to mid level inflow spinning up the mid level vortex. Whereas Nuri 2, the green line again, we have low level inflow spinning up the low level vortex. The temperature perturbations that I described with warming in the mid levels and cooling in the low levels can be seen by looking at entropy and saturated Morris entropy in these plots. One of the limitations to the analysis Dave has conducted so far is that for all his calculations, he's using the, the domain uh, observed during the, by the aircraft. So this causes limitations if the aircraft didn't observe the exact area, if the important area is smaller or bigger than the ac area actually observed by the aircraft. So that's an idea we'll talk about a little more further on. So another important question to ask is, are this mid-level spin-up and thermodynamic stabilization, is it scale dependent, and is it necessary or incidental? So Montgomery et al. in their first paper on vertical hot towers showed that you could have low-level vortex building through this vortex merge and axisymmetrization process. And a mid-level vortex could be there, but it wasn't a necessary condition. So the next thing we're going to look at is a simulation of Hurricane Felix by Zhuo Wang. 
And these basically, she looked at an, what she called an inner pouch region, which is a two de by two degree box centered on and moving with the sweet spot center, and an entire pouch region, which is a six by six degree box. And what's plotted here is a time height cross section of the change in absolute vorticity with time. And the two by two degree box, it is clear that there's low level spin up where there's nothing in the mid levels. In the larger box, we can see some mid level spin up along with the low level spin up. Her data suggests that the mid-level vortex and the strengthening of that is scale dependent. Chris Davis and David Ayevich also did some work on this and found similar results when they looked at thermal dynamic characteristics, where they found warming in the mid and upper levels and cooling in the low levels, i.e. thermal stabilization near the center of the pouch. They also noted a decrease in parcel buoyancy and an increase in mid-troposphere moisture, which we pretty much see in most of the theories. So that's the basic theory. We're now going to look at these two case studies and talk about some of these hypotheses and how they actually fit. So the first case is Typhoon Nuri, which actually holds a place close to my heart. This is the first storm I ever got to fly through, and I actually flew on the C-130 for all four of these flights, and it's how I ended up here. Um, so for Nuri, we're going to give a quick synoptic overview. With, but the crux of this talk is really going to be on the mesoscale organization of vorticity and convection, and we're going to test the thermodynamic control mechanism. So Typhoon Nuri was somewhat unique in that we got to fly on four consecutive days. Um, as you can see here, a timeline with each flight by the C-130 and the P-3. So the C-130 was flying at about 27,000 feet. It carried drop wind sons, flight level data, and uh, AXBTs to sense the ocean temperature. The P-3 was flying generally at about 10,000 feet and held the Azora radar, flight level data, and drop sons. And you can see we were able to observe it in the tropical wave stage after it was upgraded to a depression, after it was upgraded to a tropical storm, and then a uh, typhoon. We'll focus on the first two flights as that's the region of genesis and what we're primarily interested in. So for Typhoon Nuri, we were able to track the origin easterly wave back to the Central Pacific for over 10 days. So at top is a Hobmala diagram of low level 925 hectopascal relative vorticity. And you can see the wave all the way back from the Central Pacific to the Western Pacific. Now the wave had char typical characteristics of an easterly wave in the Western P Pacific dating back over 40 years, including the propagation to the Northwest as it crossed into the Western Pacific, phase speeds appropriate with those observed decades ago, as well as a maximum amplitude in the lower troposphere. So as Nuri was going into the West and North Pacific, it actually entered a region that was very hostile to tropical cyclone formation, characterized by high vertical wind shear, as well as low ocean heat content. The wave pouch was able to survive, make it through that region, and then, and then maintain until it entered a more favorable environment. This is an example of streamlines from Typhoon, uh, from Nuri in the resting and co-moving frame from 12Z 15 August at about 12 hour intervals until 12Z 17 August. As you can see, as the illustration showed before, we have an open wave in the, co -moving, in the resting frame and a closed circulation in the co-moving frame. We see early on the convection is very highly asymmetric, favored to the east, then eventually to the south of the, of the sweet spot position. Over time, however, we see the convection ends up organizing around the sweet spot. So this made it a very good case to test the marsupial paradigm in the Western Pacific Basin. From here on, we're going to look at mesoscale organization. And we're going to look at two types of data. First, we'll show just drop wind on data as an absolute ground truth, so we, know, so we can learn about Nuri's spin-up. The second thing we're going to use is Michael Bell's Samurai program, which is a 3D VAR analysis scheme incorporating both drop wind sonde data as well as Eldora radar data. We, we did two analyses using Eldora, one at a 25 kilometer horizontal resolution. We did that one to identify the sweet spot location. We then did a 10 kilometer horizontal resolution run to analyze the mesoscale spin up of the vortex. The plot here shows Nuri 1 and Nuri 2. It shows uh, radar reflectivity. Uh, so basically these are the areas that the P3 was able to sample. All of the dots and squares end up indicate drop when sawn positions. 
with the red ones being drops that didn't have any wind data for one reason or another. The boxes are at one degree apart, and some of our budget calculations we're going to show we do on boxes around the set, or concentric boxes around the sweet spot position. This is to give you a better idea of the variation of data within, within the wave pouch. You can see we have pretty good coverage for Nuri 1 with some lack of coverage to the northwest, and there's some lack of coverage to the west of Nuri 2. But given the limitations of observational data, we feel like we have a pretty good sample to use this methodology. So this is an example of uh, relative vorticity for Nuri 1 and Nuri 2 from the Samurai analysis at one and a half kilometers and five kilometers. And what we see here is wind vectors in the co-moving frame. We see a closed cyclonic circulation, multiple mesoscale vorticity anomalies located within the wave pouch. In the mid-levels, the circulation is tilted about 2.7 degrees to the southeast. The mesoscale vorticity anomalies are not in alignment. So overall, the pouch is not in good alignment. By Nuri 2, we see amplification of all the vorticity anomalies within the wave pouch at both the lower and the mid-levels. The vortex has also come into slightly better alignment as it's pushed a little bit further, as the up-level vortex is pushed a little further west. So overall, we can see in Nuri some vorticity organization near the sweet spot position. To try to quantify that, we've actually plotted relative frequencies values for absolute vorticity within the wave pouch. We did this as a radius of less than 0.5 degrees, and then at 0.5 degree intervals out to 2 degrees. The blue line is the frequency occurrence for Nuri 1 in each of the plots. The red is Nuri 2, and the green is Nuri 3, which is really just shown for reference. So you can see that the maximum at Nuri, in the innermost radius, during Nuri 1, we see the peak at a lower value than Nuri 2. We also see a much sharper peak in Nuri 2. Whereas the profiles in Nuri 1 are a little more evenly distributed, in Nuri 2, we see the higher relative frequency values closer into the sweet spot, and then these values kind of spreading out at the outermost radii. Just basically a way to quantify what we just saw looking at the horizontal pictures. We can also look at the vertical organization of the wave pouch. So this is a vertical cross-section of height versus radius of the pre during disturbance with the zero degree radius centered on the sweet spot. This is val relative frequency values of a Kuba Weiss, and the thick black line is a 50 cent percent value. So any of the warmer colors would be more than 50 percent coverage of a Kuba Weiss within that region. For the Nuri 1 case, we see spin up, we see a maximum of a Kuba Weiss right near the sweet spot position with a secondary maximum at one and one and a half degree to one and a half degree radius. We also see some indication of the mid-level vortex at about a one degree radius. By the time Nuri 2 comes along, we see consolidation of this and upward building of the vortex from just the lower levels through the middle troposphere. We no longer see this this dual maximum, and we see concentration of this vorticity close to the sweet, excuse me, Kuba Weiss, close to the sweet spot center, and also higher up vertically in the atmosphere. So to look at the convective organization, at the bottom we just have a couple IR plots with the circle centered on the sweet spot position for the times of the Nuri 1 and Nuri 2 flights. And we're going to look at the stretching tendency term. The stretching tendency allows us to focus uh, concentrate vorticity in specific regions. So in Nuri 1, when we look at the low level stretching tendency, this is the maximum stretching tendency between the surface and 1.5 kilometers. We see the maximum to the south of the sweet spot position co-located with some of the stronger convection in the south. So as it's co-located with this, it is still in the wave pouch and is concentrating vorticity, although it's not near the sweet spot center yet. By the time Nuri 2 comes along, we see the circulation with the pouch. We see stronger values of stretching tendency, once again, north and south of the wave pouch, associated with some of the stronger convective elements we see in the Typhoon Nuri's wave pouch. So we see the, the vorticity being attracted at the low levels to the sweet spot center, and the vertical stretching caused by deep cumulus convection help and organize the vorticity around this area. As I was alluding to there, it's more of a series of events that happen that help build the vorticity uh, monolith to help build the tropical cyclone. 
So as Nuri, the Nuri wave passed over Guam, we were able to observe it with the Guam Doppler radar. So this is a ground-based Doppler radar. It passed over. This is a time series at hourly intervals from 00 UTC to 14 UTC on 16 August. The black dot is the approximate sweet spot position at each time. What we see over time is that early in the cyclogenesis sequence, the convection is favored on the southern periphery of the wave pouch. Some of this convection to the north near the center is a little bit weaker. However, over time, this convection to the south all begins to die off, as is typical of the life cycle of the MCS. But remember before, what, I, what we said was that even though the convection is dying off, it's leaving vorticity behind to be aggregated into the pouch. Then over time, we see air, new areas of convection being fired up to the south east of the sweet spot and once again near the sweet spot. Over time, another convective cycle comes and the convection does indeed organize near the sweet spot. So we see multiple growth of, and decay of multiple MCSs within the wave pouch, each helping condition the environment for tropical cyclogenesis. And one of the ways it does this is through moistening of the environment. So on the right, we actually have plots from the drop wind sawn data of relative humidity for Nuri 1 on the top and Nuri 2 on the bottom. The red indicates every drop wind sawn in relative humidity profiles, whereas the blue is the mean sounding. You notice in Nuri 1 that it's a rather moist atmosphere, over 80% relative humidity through a lot of the mid and lower troposphere. However, there's a lot more variability in the soundings in the mid and upper troposphere, and there are a lot more dry soundings. For Nuri 2, the, sounding, uh, the, area, the soundings are much closer together. We see moistening at all levels, but especially in the mid-troposphere. So we see moistening in the mid-troposphere, which is consistent with many of the theories we discussed early on. So we've shown spin-up can happen in the wave pouch by the tr what I call the traditional marsupial methods. What we wanted to do was provide an independent test of the thermodynamic control hypothesized by Raymond. One of the ways we're going to do this is to examine the Haynes and McIntyre form of the circulation tendency equation. So this is basically a the change in absolute circulation can be changed by convergence of vortic absolute vorticity into the area integrating over a tilting-like term, which is similar to the tilting term in the Holton form of the vorticity equation, and friction in other subgrid scale forces. So this is from Dave Raymond's analysis, and this is the area he analyzed over for Nuri 1 and Nuri 2. These plots have the same configuration, and this is very similar to what I showed earlier. This is absolute circulation where during Nuri 1 you see a relatively uniform profile up to about 4 kilometers, then the mid-level vortex. The mass flux profile is very similar also with the top heavy one during Nuri 1 and the bottom heavy one during Nuri 2. So when you look at all this, you can then perform the circulation tendency calculation. So the net circulation tendency, which is the term on the left-hand side, is plotted in the red line in the middle. And what you see during Nuri 1 is a tendency of the system to actually spin down, suggesting that in the planetary boundary layer, frictional spin down is greater than convergence of absolute vorticity. Then, once the mid-level vortex grows, you can see the net tendency again to spin up. So this must be the key, Dave's point is this must be the key to actually spinning up the vortex. So we want to really provide an independent examination of whether or not that was true. So the first thing we did was really look simple and just look at drop songs. Was Typhoon Nuri really spinning down? So this is a drop wind song plot. These are drop wind song wind barbs from Nuri 1 and Nuri 2 at four different pressure levels, 925, 850, 700, and 500. You can see the circulation just like we showed in the samurai analysis at all levels. We have a closed cyclonic circulation. But just quantit qualitatively, from Nuri 1 to Nuri 2, it looks like the system's spinning up. The wind barbs are all greater values. It just looks like the system's getting better organized and spinning up. So to test this a little bit more, we actually can calculate tangential wind profiles using the drop wind sawn data. Within 1, 2, 3, uh, three and greater than 3 degree radiuses of the sweet spot. Blue is again Nuri 1. Red is Nuri 2. And what we can see is below 800 hectopascals, at all levels, there is spin up between Nuri 1 and Nuri 2. Although there are slight areas of spin down in, in the inner and the third radius, 
Overall, there's weak, if not stronger, spin-up in most levels throughout a deep layer of the troposphere. We see also that this is confirmed in our samurai analysis. This is a similar plot of a radial height cross-section, tangential wind plot shaded in the colors, and angular momentum surfaces are the lines. The bottom panel is actually the difference in tangential wind between Neri 2 and Neri 1. And we again see that strong low-level spin-up and weak mid-level spin-up. This suggests that it's already undergoing the spin-up process and calls into question the need for a thermodynamic control. The angular momentum surfaces pushing inward are also an indication of the spin-up occurring and the tangential wind increasing at radii close to the center of the storm. So what we did was we calculated the circulation tendency equation also. Instead of using the fixed area, however, we calculated along those boxes I showed you and a few slides back. So basically we have a box length and a height cross-section of each term of the circulation tendency equation. What is really interesting is if you pull out profiles from these cross-sections, you can get a variety of profiles even in areas are close, that are close together. In fact, the profile at two degrees, which is the red in the, in the line plot there, is actually very similar to the profile that Dave Raymond showed with spin down in the lower troposphere. So this calculation is very sensitive to the area that you're actually integrating over. And by integrating over a single area, you could be missing part of the story. What we do see, however, when we look at the whole domain of the pouch for the circulation tendency, is first of all, we see spin down in the mid-levels near the center of the pouch. This is consistent with the numerical simulations I showed you earlier from Zhuo Wang, who showed that Felix was, didn't, wasn't spinning up close to the center of the pouch. And we have strong spin up in the mid-levels at the outer regions of the pouch, once again, suggesting that this mid-level vortex is scale dependent. We also see some spin down in the lower levels, Whereas this area spin, spin down is dominated by convergence of absolute vorticity, this is more influenced by the frictional term. And you can see the frictional spin down actually lasts a pretty far distance from the sweet spot position. We do, however, see spin up close to the sweet spot and at great distances in the low levels. And this suggests that on the system scale, Nuri is indeed spinning up between Nuri 1 and Nuri 2. The final test of the thermodynamic control mechanism will be actually to look at the temperature profile. So these are virtual temperature profiles. The top is for the system scale with height and changes between Neri 1 and Neri 2. The red line is a change of virtual temperature profile calculated from just the drop wind sun data. And the, and the smooth black line is actually from the samurai data. You can see they're in pretty good agreement and that there is slight cooling in the, middle, in the low levels and slight warming in the uh, mid-levels. If you look at this at a radial height cross-section, however, what you see is very near the sweet spot, there is almost no cooling in the low levels. The warming in the mid-levels can simply be interpreted as the building of the warm core of the tropical cyclone vortex. At the outer radii, there's very little, if any, warming in the mid-levels, and then you have cooling in the mid-levels. This really, this really leads us to believe that thermodynamic control was not a necessary condition for the spin-up of Typhoon Nuri. This is a quick summary on Nuri. We just went over all of this, but this is what we saw. The second case we're going to look at is Hurricane Sandy. And although we don't have observational data of Hurricane Sandy, it's a very interesting case, and that's why we're presenting it here. We're going to look at the early stages of Hurricane Sandy. We're going to try to find out what the origin, origin of Sandy was and what the precursor disturbance was. We'll examine the Hurricane Sandy wave pouch. And then we'll prevent a stereogenesis genesis that's consistent with the marsupial paradigm, but through accretion of vorticity. We'll assess contribution from several synoptic scale features that appear to interact with Sandy. This research really came out because there was, Dave Letterman asked a guest one night where Sandy originate from, and they said, I don't know, a wave or something. So we started looking at this case a little more in depthly. In the earliest stages of Sandy, this is on 10 October, long before formation, even longer before it made its way up the East Coast and hit New Jersey. So what we see in the far eastern Atlantic is indications of the intertropical convergence zone, hi highlighted by convergence of the streamlines and relative vorticity. We also see the origin of an African easterly wave beginning to push off the west coast of Africa. 
12 hours later, still on the 10th, the, wave, the African Easterly Wave is more defined, and the ITCZ is beginning to break down. The ITCZ continues to break down over time, and the wave push off, pushes off of Africa. Now, it's very difficult to track Sandy from this point forward. We tried numerous techniques, including standard techniques such as satellite imagery, streamline analysis. It's very difficult to track. We have a Lagrangian OW parameter, which I'm not going to show here, but it shows that the Sandy precursor and the African Eastly wave are distinct features. Really, that's one of the things we tried to show is that they're distinct features because we believe the ITCZ breakdown was actually the precursor of disturbance for Hurricane Sandy. One of the ways we attempt to distinguish these features is with a latitudinally averaged Hobmuller diagram of ECMWF derived total precipitable water. So this is averaged between 10 and 14 north. And we see the higher, the higher moisture content associated with the African easterly wave as it pushes off the coast of Africa and progresses westward through the Atlantic till about 21 October. The pre-Sandy wave, on the other hand, which originated from the ITCZ breakdown, is well west of the African easterly wave. And you can see it propagating eastward also until it eventually forms Sandy in the Caribbean. Another way we tried to track it is using the SIMS total precipitable water product. This is a product that combines satellite data to produce a observed TPW analysis. So these are three products from the 16th, 17th, and 18th of October. So we can see early on in this period in the box, we see a, break, a wave roll up. And this is actually the precursor disturbance that forms Hurricane Sandy. As it continues to push eastward, you see higher values of moisture, but it gets a little more lost in the moist mid-Caribbean. The disturbance up here, in case anybody's eyes are attracted to that, is actually Hurricane Raphael, which pushed well north of the area. So the secondary, so the, the conclusion that we came up with was that Sandy originated from the ITCZ breakdown. And the second motivation for the investigation of Hurricane Sandy was actually one of my co-authors, Tim Dunkerton, during the HS3 field campaign. He was sitting in Wallops Island waiting for something to happen, and Anybody that's watched the Atlantic last year knows not much has happened. So one night he was daydreaming and saw a situation similar like this. Although this is Sandy, this is what he saw a month earlier. So this is basically the Caribbean region. You see South America, uh, Cuba, Yucatan Peninsula. And he thought, well, there's all this vorticity here. If something could just go through like a bowling ball and collect all this vorticity, could we actually build a tropical cyclone that way? So that's an idea we started investigating. So these are several of the synoptic scale features we're going to look at during the rest of this talk and try to assess whether they contributed to the development of Sandy. We have vorticity generated along the northern edge of the South American coast from the South American Convergence Zone, which is basically a westward extension of the ITCC. We have a low-level gyre in, in, uh, in the eastern Caribbean, a weak easterly wave, and there's also vorticity generated along the northern portion of the island of Hispaniola. This is actually the pre-Tony wave. Tony was another tropical storm that formed after Sandy. Um, and it's well upstream of this pre-Sandy wave. In the middle of all this is actually a weak wave that is the pre-Sandy wave. So we're, oops. So we're going to talk really quick. We're going to describe the tropical cyclogenesis sequence and then try to assess which of these features are actually critical to the genesis of Hurricane Sandy. So first, we're going to look at the wave pouch. These, again, are streamlines in the co-moving frame overlaid with IR brightness temperature as a proxy for convection. Early on in the sequence, about 18Z on the 17th, we see very little organization of a wave pouch. Over time, the wave pouch begins to organize more, and you begin to see a little bit of a distinct circulation. Throughout most of this, though, we notice that the wave pouch is actually open to the south. Over time, convection eventually intensifies, it's not quite organized around the sweet spot, though. So, though you can see it's axisymmetric, with the maximum convection focused east of the circulation center and somewhat to the south. Part of the reason for this is the open wave pouch, and I'll show later that that area is actually more moist. The other reason for this is the vertical shear impinging on the wave pouch itself, where we have a lot of northerly and northwesterly shear pushing on the wave pouch, helping, helping uh, the, excuse me, navigate and influencing the location of that convection. So these are the Lagrangian boundaries for Sandy on 19 October. And what you can see, you see the unstable and stable manifolds. These are, they're kind of wiggly. 
But the main point is that there is an opening to the pouch of the pouch to the south. And I'll show a couple more of these later that are a little more clear. But really what I wanted to show was that this opening to the south, as opposed to Gaston where the opening to the south let all this dry air in, we actually have a moist environment to the south of Sandy. So as the opening to the south pulls the air in, it's drawing in moist air, which is speeding the tropical cyclone development. So what we're going to look at is several of these synoptic scale features and try to assess whether or not they contributed to spin up and the growth and the intensification of Sandy. As the boundary to the south is open, this boundary is actually open and allowing vorticity to be pulled off the South American Convergence Zone basically throughout the sequence of this. This boundary is continuously open and we show that it actually allows vorticity to enter and grow the vortex. This weak easterly wave Area B, by the highlight, is able to merge with, the, with this pre-Sandy vortex also, and basically helps grow the vortex, but doesn't have much effect on the, uh, on, the, on the strengthening of it. You can see a little bit of vorticity north of the wave, but the Lagrangian boundary is actually above, solid to the north of the wave, so the vorticity generated on the northern part of the Hispaniola Island is unable to enter the pouch itself. And there's also a little vorticity around the periphery um, that is able to merge with the outer bands of, of, the, of the vortex, but likely doesn't strengthen it. So this is a, just a theory on Genesis, and the Lagrangian boundaries will help us show what th the things are that are really excluded. So this is valid on 20 October, and you can see the stable manifold that forms a solid boundary to the north. This excludes the vorticity, as I mentioned before, from Hispaniola. Boundary to the south is open, South American Convergence Zone, uh, vorticity can enter. The vorticity for the Caribbean gyre is actually located outside of the boundary, created outside of the boundary. So from that we conclude that the vorticity for the Caribbean gyre had no influence on the growth of Sandy. So the summary would really be the South American Virgin Zone and vorticity from the easterly wave were the major contributors along with the vorticity associated with the pre-Sandy wave. Another way to look at this is by, by, through a latitude tracer. So what this is is a latitude tracer evected forward on 20 and 22 October. You see the dark colors are low latitude air and the light colors are high latitude air. Over time we see that more of the low latitude air is getting into the center of the system. This confirms the opening in the wave pouch and that the air from south of the system was able to enter the center of the pre-sandy pouch. Our final way to assess these contributions is again to look at the, is to look at the circulation tendency equation. We're going to focus mainly on the convergence term, and we'll break the convergence of absolute vorticity up into a relative component and a planetary component. Now, if accretion of vorticity is really acting to spin up the disturbance, we're going to see some areas where the relative vorticity is dominating the spin up as opposed to the planetary vorticity, and hopefully at distances associated with those accretion areas. Next to it, we have plots of tangential wind profiles for the 20, 21, and 22 October. And all this data is computed on the ECMWF analysis data. On 0 z 20th October, there's very little indication of accretion of vorticity, as the planetary vorticity is generally the leading contributor to the total spin up through vorticity convergence. However, by 21 October, almost all the vorticity, almost all the spin up is attributed to spin up through relative vorticity. This suggests that the accretion of vorticity process is actually helping to strengthen as well as grow the vortex. And we see over time the corresponding tangential wind profile, we see a broadening of the tangential wind maximum and an increase in the value of the tangential wind. Over time, we see that there are some areas and locations where the relative vorticity actually dominates planetary vorticity, suggesting accretion. I didn't provide all the plots here, but this one's kind of an extreme case. This is more of the common case where you're seeing these spurts of accretion of vorticity from several of these synoptic scale features that we talked about. So this is the quick sandy summary. We believe the wave originated from an ITCZ breakdown. We had an opening in the pouch boundary to the south, which is an interesting deviation from the standard marsupial model, and that it allowed accretion of vorticity and moist air to enter the pouch, and therefore it was favorable to generosis. We talked about the first and second order contributors, and this is a good illustration of how a pouch opening can be favorable to Genesis, rather than the case that most people think about, such as Gaston, where the pouch allows dry air in. 
And that is all I have today. Thank you, Lou. Any questions for Lou? Has, I didn't hear the beginning, sorry, but has the National Hurricane Center now started to use the uh, flow relative coordinates in determining when a tropical depression is identified? Um, or does it affect their thinking? We, 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 uh, that's, uh, I mean, obviously Mike's, Mike's trying to get them to think this way. Most people, most people are open to the idea, if, if they don't agree with all the specifics, most people are open to the idea. I don't know the National Hurricane Center is specifically ingrained into there into their, uh, pro their operational process. I know that for the, for, the field, for the HS3 campaign, you know, they were doing almost everything in their relative frame for all their forecasting and try to figure out where to go and predict also, but of course that was Mike's project. To what do you attribute the ITC Z breakdown? That is, um, the ITC Z break. For this case, we don't have a specific answer. I mean, the ITC Z can break down. It can be forced by a wave. You can get instabilities along the ITC Z that'll cause it to break down. There are simulations showing it'll just break down on its own within a number of days. It, it, we just don't have the fidelity to have an answer for that for this particular case. Um, it's, it's something we've looked at. Most of the cases we looked at have been true wave cases, and, and the, the Sandy case was interesting in that we, we're providing these forecasts a lot of times in real time for the HS3 and other things, and the initial take on Sandy was we missed it because it was so weak as the wave progressed the Atlantic, and we didn't catch the ITCZ breakdown because we don't specifically look in the ITCZ region for this type of development. So it was really a good learning opportunity for us, and it gives us another opportunity to expand how we're doing our wave tracking for the future. But for this case, we don't, we, we don't have the fidelity to answer that. Any more questions? Another one. <laughs> so you ended up with a different conclusion from Dave Raymond. and. It looked to me actually like you were using the same data set though. Yes. Pri primarily the uh, drop sun data set. And so was the reason that they were using the entire domain and you were using, using subdomains, but otherwise doing the same analysis? Right, uh, the, analysis is, the analysis technique is different. Whereas we're using Michael Bell's Samurai analysis, Dave has his own objective analysis scheme. So there is a slight difference in the analysis, even though we're both, even though both with analysis scheme incorporating the drop and sons and Eldora radar data. We provided, when we, when we started examining the changes, we tried to replicate every single one of the plots in his paper. And we came close enough to re replicating everything that he did with our data set that we feel that the differences aren't from the analysis, me the analysis mechanism, Samurai versus Dave's, but rather these differences are in the analysis technique and interpretation of the data. If you look at the plot of circulation tendency, like I said, I can pull out a profile from about two degrees and it looks very similar to his calculation. And I've actually done his calculation where uh, that three panel plot and our plots look entirely similar. So the theory really is we go out and we, fall, fly, we fly these tropical depressions, these pre-tropical depressions, right? These are tropical waves. And the PI is there, and he's just drawing a square spiral or a lawnmower pattern over where he thinks the storm will be. That's not necessarily the most important region. You haven't necessarily nailed your forecaster. So by just analyzing the region that we sampled, it's probably not giving you the whole picture of what you need to know and what's important to spin up. And as a follow-up, Dave Raymond would agree on that. Ah, uh, we've had these discussions with Dave Raymond uh, often over the last few years, and uh, um, we have tried. We have tried to convince him. We've tried to convince him that our way may be right, but I don't know right if right's the right word. That our way's you know improved, but it, it's not just us. We're, we're looking at the radio profile. Zuo Wang has done it, and she's look, she looks at radial profiles. Chris Davis does it, and he looks at an inner and outer pouch region. So you can sh they've both shown that the thermal structure in the inner versus the whole pouch is different. 
So it's not just us, you know, that's looking at this. There's several people have shown there's different thermal structures between the inner and outer pouch region. Um, so yeah, we've 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 talked to Dave about this all the time. He reviews our papers, we review his, we go back and forth, and we need another field project to sort it out. Well, you mentioned that you need another field project to. Uh do something about it. And uh, if you are the next PI, what what observation do you really need in order to answer these questions? A radar would be nice. <laughs> uh, an airborne radar would be nice. High resolution, high resolution profile drop once on profiles would be re very nice. Uh, the drop once on profiles, if we get them high spatial resolution. Sampled from high and high spatial resolution. Um, I think those would do, and you need a lot of them because, like I said, we don't know exactly what the right area to measure. So you, the best, the best strategy from my perspective is to do some kind of square spiral, bon carpet the area with drop wind sons, and have the P3 or some other aircraft operating within, or APAR operating within, with a radar. That would be, I think, the best strategy. But we really need, you know, high spatial resolution and high vertical resolution uh, data to accomplish this. So, uh, in, in Predict and and T Park, we tried. I mean, there, there were multiple aircraft uh, in the experiment. And do you think you need more than one drop on, uh, drop sound aircraft in order to? Get what you need in terms of temporal and the spatial resolution. Just from drop quinsons or for? Yes. I think if you had the right aircraft, you could probably do the drop quinsons by yourself. Uh, if you had the right aircraft and the right capability to launch them quick enough, you could probably do it with one aircraft. I mean, and and T Park and TCS08. I mean, the the, the Eldora radars, you know, was wonderful. I mean. The case of Nuri, we still have tons. Of, we, I shouldn't say that, but there's still a lot that can be learned from the radar data we collected just during Nuri. So that's an invaluable aspect to this. But I think you could probably do it with one if you could get the drops out fast enough and, and have good spacing and a good prediction location. Uh, with regards to the sounds, uh, how much importance do you think the uh, you mentioned higher altitude sound releases? How important is uh, higher altitude sounds? with respect to what you had from the C-130? So for T-Park, basically, the C-130 was at 27,000 feet, and the P-3 was generally around 10,000 feet. For PREDICT, uh, the G-5 was at whatever, 40, 41, 42. For HS-3, they have uh, the Globe Hawks out there flying at 50, 60. The main benefit, one of the disadvantages to flying lower is you can't calculate full profiles, and you can't calculate cape, you can't calculate buoyancy. You don't get a full profile of the atmosphere, so you can't accurately calculate cape. And this is something that's been in a couple of Chris Davis' paper where he's looked at cape differences, talking about the stabilization between the inner and outer pouch. And this is something that we really need to look at more closely and really need to evaluate. And if you have a, the aircraft flying at 27,000 feet, such in the Nuri case, we're not sure that we can calculate the full value of cape because we don't know if we can least lift the parcel to the equilibrium level. That's something we're actually looking at now. So that's why the higher altitude drop sounds are, are really important for this type of study. Uh, just one related to Wen Chao's question is, what would have helped the forecast of Sandy? What observations would have helped that? The forecast. The forecast for development or forecast for? The, for the, the, yeah, the forecast for development and tracking uh, didn't work out very well. <laughs> <laughs> See, well, uh, it depends. Sandy, Sandy, the forecast later on, obviously, when it, there was divergence forecasts, obviously, between the ECMWF and the GFS, right? After it formed, it passed over Cuba. You have one for, these forecasts going like this, right? And the ECMWF actually did a fairly good job. Um, with the storm earlier on, earlier in the GFS. And you can see that in the data, I'm sure. If anybody's seen a Sandy talk, people show that all the time. Um, the, with that situation, it was, I believe, I'm not an expert on that stage, 
but it was more large-scale influences that influenced the, the GFS had the large scale, the large scale incorrect. So wh whatever you can do to better characterize a large scale, whether it's you know satellite observations or or whatever, but it would be tough. Uh, it would be tough with a research project, you know, with just the aircraft observations to do that. So basically, you'd have to characterize a large scale better. And the ECMWF does so much better job with their data assimilation. That's probably why eventually the GFS came online. But that would be a hard one to. Somebody's done work on looking at uh, the predictability. A couple people have looking at the predictability, and I'm not an expert on that area. So, uh, I was I was thinking more of the genesis, really, and what you focused on. As far as the genesis, you know, that that's really the the genesis is really interesting because we saw all those regions of vorticity out there, and formations in the Pacific are. Uh, they really have a maximum in two regions. They really have a maximum in October and then early on in the year in May. Um, so, so a nice large scale analysis to actually t characterize what the basin looks like uh, would be really nice for that. The interesting thing would have been about in Sandy's cases would have been what do you go after, right? We have all these weak waves that we don't know if they're gonna form. So would you even be able to pick the right thing to go after? And that would be a challenge. But I think generally the same, the same observations would be needed, drop sons, uh, Eldora radar data, and go from there, and really be able to characterize the true state of the environment before you can predict it. Could you say a little bit about uh uh, what the role of a, a numerical model like WARF might be in this kind of study? Um, we have, okay, so most of our studies we do, most of the studies I do are observational based studies. Um, where we're trying to look at the observations, find out what's happening. Uh, some interesting studies that, uh, not that I'm doing, but one of Mike Montgomery's students, some of his colleagues are doing, are some data denial studies uh, from for NURI, based, uh not for NURI, for some of the HS3 cases. They're doing some data denial studies where they put in observations, run the model, see if it forms, taking the observations out, run the model, see if it forms. Uh, they're kind of, they're pretty early on some of the work. They're doing some HS3 and some predict cases. They're early on some of the work. That's a, that's a good application of the observational quality. Uh, with radar observations, it's it's all about the data assimilation and what you keep and what you don't. And I'm not an expert on data assimilation, but some people throw almost everything out, say the radar observations didn't matter. Other people say the radar observations really didn't matter. I really think that's an area that needs to be explored more, but I that's not my area of expertise. But there are some things where you can do data denial studies that could be very important to find out if these observations are good and impacting the model. Any more questions? Guess not. Let's give thank you, Lou, again.